Okay, so the talk, I'm going to talk about the uh, galvanic table, then sacrificial anodes, the alloys for them, and then a, uh, a run through design and manufacture of actual anodes, uh, just showing some casting and things like that. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a design of anodes to, to make a, a basically a CP system or to protect the structure. And then just show you, you know, anodes and that, and, and look at a typical installation, say, of a, a, actually of a harbor wall. Um, corrosion. Um, I think really everybody, a lot of people know, know what it's about, but what's actually happening here is uh, the materials which we have alloyed together, made into metals, um, have lots of trapped energy. They're in the metastable state. They want to get back to, uh, they want to release energy. They want to get to a lower energy state and they want to get back to the earth, to the ore that they came from. So that's what, that's why we have corrosion in my estimation anyway. Um, so we've developed these systems of, of uh, protection of these, um, these materials. Our, our primary materials by using the principles which were probably discovered um, by nature of the, the the range of materials can be arranged on a galvanic table. And I dare say a discovery really that um, by joining any two of these metals um, and the further apart that they are on the table, uh, the, the more aggressive will be either the protection or the attack of the other metal. And that's the principle of the, uh, the galvanic table. Um, so it's showing you from platinum, graphite, and gold, etc., cetera, um, at, at one end of the noble metals. And then you have our favorites of uh, magnesium, zinc, aluminium alloys, etc., at the top. And um, so in terms of anodic materials, um, yeah, these are the ones that we're going to be uh, focusing on. So to mitigate corrosion uh, by cathodic protection, we do it by a means of imposing a current um, which will halt the, uh, and reduce the corrosion level to one which is totally insignificant. There are still a residual amount of corrosion that happens. And how do we do it? We're using the, either the galvanic properties of two dissimilar metals, a bimetallic system, um, when they're joined together in a conductive medium or an electrolyte um, to create an anode cathode uh, situation. You can do this alternatively by imposing an, ele uh, an electrical current using a, a, a powered system and non-consumable anodes. Um, so that's that's for another day, and for another business to uh, <laughs> to uh, prophesy about. Sacrificial anode. Once we this is just showing you the chemistry of it, and we'll go a bit faster on this. Um, if you join an aluminium anode material or a, a, in a galvanic sense, um, an aluminium to a steel in this seawater that we, that we have it, um, we then get a lot of chemistry going on. We've got ions um, being lost in the uh, anodic reaction and oxidation taking place. At the same time, we've got electrons running down the, the steelwork and a reaction taking place at the cathode where it's, uh, it's breaking down the, uh, the water, uh, essentially, and giving off bubbles of hydrogen. And we are getting, we're getting protection of the cathode by the anode. And in addition, we, we do get this calcareous deposit, which is um, usually not not discussed very much, but in fact, it's actually essential part of a good um, system, a CP system. 
and it's uh, it's uh, it helps reduce the amount of current that's actually required on, say, burr steel. So, what's the primary requirements of a sacrificial anode? Um, sacrificial anode material um, is you have it has to have a potential which is sufficiently electronegative, and then we we've looked at the galvanic table there, and we know that. Um, aluminium, zinc, magnesium, et cetera, at the top. So those were the natural uh, materials as base metals for the selection. Um, and they can be alloyed with other elements which make it even more electronegative. And this is why you know, we add other uh, materials like, uh, like zinc, et cetera, and um, activators to, to uh, make our, our anodes uh, perform um, in a more stable way and, and be, be more electronegative. Um, anode materials also have to, they have to react in the, in the conductivity, in the conductivity range that we're, we're, we want to work in, the natural ambient in, environment. And in our case, it's, you know, oil and gas and seawater is the, is the, is the general sense. And then um, it, you want in the material to have a broad active, a temperature range of, of operation. Um, and in terms of material cost, et cetera, you want high output for the amount of kilos consumed and a low metal cost, um, which is almost impossible these days, as we, as we know the price of materials. Um, have I gone down? No. So when Aluminium anodes are, um, are are created. They're using the aluminium base, and it was it was originally discovered that um, that we are able to uh, raise the potential by uh, tests that we're doing. We're, we're done by basically adding all elements of, <laughs> of the periodic table to to the uh, the main materials and um, it came out that um, uh, the, the additions of cadmium, zinc, magnesium, uh, mercury, tin, indium, are, um, and, and gallium in particular, um, are uh, raising that potential. So historically, the, the materials that were developed um, probably in the uh, 40s and 50s, and they were still using some of these in the 70s to 80s. Um, originally, where where the uh, aluminium zinc tin system and the aluminium zinc um, mercury, although for various reasons these have fallen out of favour, um, the the uh, the tin based ones, I believe, had uh, uh, have suffered uh, some issues in the North Sea to do with with fracturing and cracking and loss of material, um, probably due to um, using it in, in a colder climate um, than perhaps used in the uh, American Gulf in the, originally. Um, the, the, the mercury is, is an obvious one in that um, we, whilst it uh, had a beautiful, um, beautifully high um, uh, ampere hours per kilo, um, it's uh, it actually well obviously it's it's a toxic material and it fall, fell out of favour and was not able to be used environmentally and so those have literally been banned. We're now using um, the favoured Indian uh, aluminium zinc indium based system along with our traditional uh, zinc materials um, which uh, was developed into a, a military. Uh, military zinc, which is, uh, is uh, contains aluminium and cadmium as its uh, as its main main additions and activators. So, so we now the the traditional the alloys that we have for sacrificial anodes are um, basically of three different types. We have magnesium, um, we have zinc. And we have an aluminium series, and these can be used. There's a lot of detail on here, but um, 
what this is, is showing is we have the major elements in yellow, which are additions to the, uh, the base materials. And, um, and the, the, the rest of them essentially are impurities. Um, but we have different properties for these, these three. And um, I think it's summarized a little easier in here, whereby magnesium anodes are of a high potential and they're fairly reactive, particularly, um, particularly if you try and put them in salt water. So they're limited to, to, to use in say fresh water and they're extremely useful uh, for burying in soil where you've got um, clays and bentonite, et cetera, which you can uh, create, which gives you a conductive medium. Uh, so they're not, you can also use them in short term deployment in seawater, but um, they do fizz like sherbet. So, um, and they use for, they're also used for cleaning tanks, et cetera, whereby it basically blows the, uh, the, the descale, uh, it blows the, uh, the, the, the paint off the inside of, of tanks. Um, that's just a, an alternative use. <laughs> Zinc, uh, very much favoured by, say, fishing boats and, and vessels, mainly because it's, uh, it's, it's able to be used across from seawater into, uh, into brackish water. So in harbours, et cetera, and estuaries, you haven't got too much of a problem with the activity. And unlike some like magnesium, you can't, uh, you can't take something out of an estuary and then, and then uh, expect it to to, to survive and protect your boat. Um, aluminium has now come into favour and it's, uh, it's even now used on, on a lot of fishing boats as well. Um, although people are sceptical about using it, um, but it was pioneered really by the oil industry, mainly because um, it has a high capacity, relatively low cost, and it's uh, very good for large, long life installations like harbors and, um, and uh, subsea uh, equipment that's, that's uh, being deployed for 20, 25 years. Very reliable and very stable. Um, the, the alloys that we now work with in, in, in aluminium, which is probably um, maybe 90% of the world's use of anodes is, in sacrificial anodes is possibly aluminium based. And we have, uh, we have now a development whereby people are using um, a set of alloys which are, have been decided and uh, put into standards. And uh, these are, um, these, these are basically, um, we call them calling them here ally A1 to A4. Um, A1 to A3 are basically um, a gradual refinement of the um, of the, the properties and the performance of these alloys. So alloy A1 um, you can see has a, a broad um, zinc range and then the indium level down to 0.01. Uh, this is percent, so very small amounts of, of indium. But as you, um, you're ignoring most of the other elements, we then uh, move up to alloy A2, which is um, uh, similar to a, a NORSOC um, M503 standard material, which is universally used for offshore use uh, to depths of water around about um, up to about 300 meters, I believe. And below that, um, the stability of, you know, people wanting more reliable materials, um, they're, using, uh, they're using a refined range of, of zinc, a higher level of zinc, a higher level of indium. And what I've neglected to say here is that, that all these, the main issue, the main refinement here is the reduction of the iron uh, and to some extent the reduction of the amount of copper which is which is as there is an impurity and so the one of the main um, issues with um, with making anodes in the first place was trying to get the source ingot um, a very high grade ingot which would 
um, which would have very low iron and low copper because those two elements tend to in interfere with the um, with the stability of the uh, and they they cause passivation etc in, in the anode so so for these deep water alloys in say alloy A3 with high reliability we are putting in um, we're using less than 06 um, iron for those applications and uh, they've used the nanodes down at uh, for you know three four thousand meters uh, i believe uh, and and these these can be relatively stable silicon here is is, is also a, is an element which was put into an original material called galvalum 3 which you may have heard of and that is um, widely copied now. The uh, the patent expired about twenty years ago, and uh, it is it's used universally, and uh, and in fact it encompasses all the compositional ranges of, of what I've discussed here, uh, in a sense when it was originally developed. But these are now put into pockets. These these three or four materials. Okay, so so let's just talk about how we go and make some anodes. We go and make some material, use some material. Um, what we do is, uh, apart from having a foundry um, with, you know, large gas furnaces or, you know, electrical heating furnaces, uh, the materials that we're using are um, aluminium ingot. And as I mentioned there, we're using, um, you know, when our, a lot of, materials around the world are not all, they're not very low iron purity, depending on which smelters they come from, which ores we use. And so, you know, that's why we've had a development of lots of different types of, of aluminium um, uh, anode materials, including the addition of magnesium and manganese, et cetera, and, and, and silicon to try and absorb the iron and, and make, put it into intermetallics and and prevent it from interfering with the stability of the, uh, you know, the, the material. And so, but now these days we we can actually start to use. Uh, we got more reliable supply, and we are using uh, generally a, a grade on the LME. Uh, we're buying uh, aluminium uh, of, of PO six ten grade, as it's known, and this is uh, this is a standard grade, um, and that 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 nomenclature means that you are using 0.06 silicon and uh, 0.1 iron is, is the maximum um, level. And so you, you, you will get smelters which, uh, which run, you know, say uh, that grade right up to the mark. But you can buy, you can buy an 06 grade, which is, a, I think it's a PO406, uh, it's known as, and then you get an 04 silicon and an, o, an 06, uh, uh, 06 iron. And that's the premium grade. And uh, you don't go much further from that on, you know, often, unless you go into superconductors and all sorts of things. You can buy more refined aluminium and people do that at a smaller level. The addition of, of zinc is that's used from standard zinc. It's a special high grade SHG. That's made in all the uh, and lots of lots of smelters and places like Norway, etc., where they have traditionally had hydroelectricity. Again, like aluminium, uses a lot of electricity, etc., to to actually to smelt and uh, you know make these these materials. Indium is a is a four nines product. Uh, there's no contamination there uh, from uh, within those 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 angles. And then we also, if we're using silicon, we would use a, a hardener, as it's called, which is a um, you can't put pure silicon into uh, into aluminium uh, because it has a melting point of something like 1500 centigrade. So you have to pre-alloy it to get it uh, to to work, and and so it drops its uh, melting temperature down to about five or six hundred centigrade. So we get a furnace, we put the base metal in there, we add the zinc, and we throw in some indium to the right addition. This is all done by weight percent. 
and it's fairly reliable. You can weigh this out and what you put in, you should get out. Um, you heat this molten metal to, um, to around 760 is the sort of, you know, the minimum melting temperature of this, this alloy with the 5% zinc in it and stir it, prepare it and uh, make it homogeneous by, by stirring it. We can then, um, we can sample that by just making a simple chilled disc in a, uh, and, and we can then do some test spectrometry of which um, a very fast method, which you can get a result of in two or three minutes is by optician, <laughs> it's optical emission spectroscopy. Um, and that is a, a spark um, a test which gives you a, 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 a split um, beam of light, etc., which is, is then analyzed by a, by a set of uh, detectors that uh, is a bit like scattering. And you can then, by a, it's a comparative method of, of actually arriving at a, a, at a good percentage um, of elements across the board for say about 14 different elements there. Um, then you pour them and uh, this just shows you the sort of things that you might do here is um, if you have, we actually to make sacrificial anodes, they're strange things. They're not, they're not like normal foundry products. You, um, you're actually making blocks of metal. Uh, you don't need closed uh, mold sand systems like you do in uh, other foundries. We're using open trough molds and we're actually using a, making it a, it's a composite, uh, which is another strange thing because in, in a the foundry, you don't usually have this situation. So we're, we're going to put a steel insert right the way through um, the anode in, or, in order that we, it, it's a conductor bar to basically, um, you know, and, and something which supports the anode material. Um, and so we can then, once we've shot blasted this uh, to give it maximum sort of uh, bonding, because it doesn't, it doesn't metallically bond aluminium to, to, to steel, it sort of sits on the surface and, and, and keys into the, the blasted surface. Zinc is a different animal there. It, it, as you know, it, when galvanizing, it can actually, does actually coat and, and form an intermetallic bond. Um, so if you're, You've got your insert in place, you can then pour your metal basically over the top of it and uh, leave the, um, the straps sticking out the sides. Um, and you have to manually top these things up. Um, they are horrendous materials, probably uh, from an engineering point of view, because they, uh, the aluminium 5% zinc has a, you know, quite a few will crack. Uh, if not, and it has a very vicious sort of shrinkage on it, and so it needs feeding. And we do this manually. Everybody does it manually, and you can you can actually put these some of these materials through um, die casting, etc. But it's very tricky um, because of the, the the large the large shrinkage, and because of the composite nature of it, the differential um, expansion of the steel bars and the materials there. And you do get some you know, movement and bending, et cetera, if you don't control it. Uh, so tricky product and not a standard sort of foundry sort of thing. You're not making engine blocks here. And in fact, you, you, you are working, remember we are working with a material which is um, essentially a, does not conform to standard, say commercial aluminum anode materials. It's got indium and things which are poisonous to standard commercial um, alloys, uh, and you don't recycle it along with them because uh, it will. It, the activators in these anodes are actually designed for, to um, make them crumble, in in a layman's sense. How do we design these um, these bracelets and and, and more sophisticated? Um, pieces of, uh, you know, uh, steel work in order to get something that we can say wrap around a pipe 
well there's quite a lot of engineering in it um you get people very surprised as to how much these things may cost given the fact that uh, all you're doing is pouring some aluminium out into a box which is what some people uh, have said to us um why is it so expensive well because everybody wants uh, the thing welding uh, in a cage and you also want it you also want it mpi'd and then uh, it all has to fit you have to create molds uh, steel molds at that in order to to actually uh, get this um, product done uh, so here we go um, curved molds etc fabricated from steel or cast iron etc for which you can then put mandrels etc in you have to put your steel work in you then have to get the thing out once you've uh, cast metal so you're going to pour metal into the uh, into the gaps here uh, hot metal while um, while holding on to everything and making sure that these uh, these steel molds and are like sealed and they don't leak. Um, then you end up with a product if you're lucky, um, which should fit back on the mandrel and um, and can be um, can be bolted together uh, and offered to a pipe. We uh, you know on these materials they are um, they, we put epoxy and things on the inside of the of the um, the anode materials. Mainly to uh, to stop the um, the loss of material on the inside, which is adjacent to the strap, which is retaining the um, the aluminium which is cast onto it, so we prevent loss from the inside. Testing of these materials, uh, we can do lots of things. Um, essentially, um, these are all just uh, quality checks. Um, if you cast your anode material um, correctly, you you shouldn't have uh, you know you're checking your, your basic dimensions etc. That's reliant upon your molds. You can have cracks and from large amounts of shrinkage if not careful. And there are there are hundreds of configurations of anodes. It's unbelievable that um, you know we're casting anodes from um, from say one kilo aluminium to 450 kilos of aluminium. And they're on different straight ascent, uh, sizes, widths, and they can be what three meters long. So these are these can be monsters, and they can also be very difficult to um, to control shrinkage, cracking, feeding, etc. As you're doing it, so this is why these these checks are in place. But generally, uh, you don't have much of a problem um, if you. Um, if you do your steel work right, you, you, you secure it in, in, in position. Uh, so we can check the shape, the dimensions, etc., and ensure customers that we, we, we're giving them the right weight as well um, by doing volume calculations, etc., before we do this. Um, we can check electrical continuity between the bar that we put in and the anode material. Um, I'm told that um, you can get the same results on a bit of rusty steel, which is cast. And I thought we had a, uh, so, but, but um, generally all these steels are actually prepared to, to the high cleanliness level to give you the maximum reliability. Electrochemical testing. Um, this is a this is a secondary test within the manufacturing of sacrificial anodes. Um, the standards are basically saying that you should do one of these uh, for production control. Let's say every fifteen tons of uh, material, which is um, given that you know you you can cast you, you can do samples on every batch or every um, uh, every set of materials that you want. Um, these these tests um you know, given the time restrictions we've got here um they're basically set up to um to do a um to basically be a comparative or performance test they're not actually a um they're not actually representative of the real situation and that's because when you do 
electrochemical testing, you have to you have to accelerate the testing because the the amount of material loss that you're trying to detect when you're when you're setting this up is uh, is minuscule. You use it, you might be losing a gram, so the accuracy can be very low. So what you what what they do in these tests is you actually you actually increase the uh, you have an impressed current and you you step this up to about 20 times the field current density that you would normally get um, on an anode. Hence you do get some uh, you do get uh, higher levels of capacity uh, when you measure the capacity and uh, you, you'll get variations particularly over time when you do these accelerated tests. Um, Largely, I mean, it's, uh, it's not, I don't think it's just my opinion, but um, electrochemical testing is uh, a lot is made of it. But it, it was essential when you're developing these alloys uh, in the first, you know, in the laboratory. And once these compositional uh, levels were, were checked and then field trials were done, um, we really are just relying upon uh, composition analysis by composition as being the, the primary uh, way that we determine that we've made the right thing. Um, you're more likely to um, get a failure from the, the preparation of these samples than you are, uh, or the, uh, the test rig um, continuity or something, than you are actually a failure due to the materials themselves. Um, so how do you design a cathodic detection system? Well, um, in order to design an anode or an an, an, a, block, a, a set of anodes that are gonna go on to a, uh, a, a, a installation, say a, a frame, it might be a harbor wall, um, you're first of all deciding how, how long you want to, want to uh, protect this for. So the years are months, uh, usually years uh, for things like um, large harbors and, 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 and oil installations, short term stuff, maybe uh, it's three, three months to a year for all these frames that go down with equipment on in, in you know, subsea. Um, what, what is essential about designing a, um, a sacrificial anode system is you are, you actually, adding up all the areas of the cathode of the steelwork and that you want to protect, whether it be painted, bare, coated, plated, and you are, you are then uh, going to design an anode which has a surface area which gives out, um, gives out current um, to match the amount of current that is required with your, with your steel work, et cetera. So it's all about the areas. Um, there's very little else to it. That's, that's the main thing. All the other parameters, such as, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the performance due to geographic region, um, depth of water, uh, and, you know, are, our refinements to that. And uh, you do have, obviously you do have some quite large variations when you go from estuarine to say seawater, when you go down geographically, and you go around the world from the equator, et cetera, in temperatures which are going from say four degrees centigrade to 30 degrees centigrade in the equator. So these are the sort of things which you have to compare using your, your um, design. You need to design current densities. Um, these are all tabulated by by DMV. So, for instance, uh, as uh, and the, and you're able to take also coating breakdown factors. These are allowances for paint which is on on steel wear. Um, resistivity of the medium is the seawater, estuarine water, or in some instances, muds and sediments or soils in which it's buried. Um, and so, but, sorry, Nigel, to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, you have, just to remind you, you have ten, 10 minutes 
Yeah. But it's a little bit late, so and we need to keep 10 minutes for the question answer. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so in getting a design solution, um, you might select, you might have to select your anode material, uh, whether it be aluminium, zinc, or magnesium, but a lot of, a lot of the time we're talking about aluminium. Um, so you multiply up all the areas of the materials and the current density and the coating factors, etc. And you calculate the mean current demand, which will then give you a mean mass for the amount of mass that you need to protect your your actual um, component. Um, so once you've done that, you then you would then just you would then try and select the type of anode, the shape of anode, whether it be flush or elongated, which you want to put onto your structure. How many anodes are you going to use? Um, you basically want to spread them out and you want it to be symmetrical in terms of the way that you arrange these in, in the clear intervals. Uh, and you can calculate the, um, one, of, one of the things once you've calculated the mass, what we are interested in is the amount of current your anodes and that will put out initially when we put it into the water and um, this this is actually the the initial current is the one which is going to polarize the structure and get it over that hill and once the structure is polarized the current will then does actually reduce the the, the current necessary reduces mainly due to things like the calcareous deposits which actually which actually um, deposit themselves on the cathode or the steelwork. And this means that you then have a much lower um, current demand for the rest of the life of the system. These anodes will, um, in their initial shape, give out, that, give out that current that you've designed it to. And then at the end of its life, all the anode material starts to be lost from these bars and you get down to what is known as around about 15, 10 to 15% of the anode materials left. And that is when your anodes need replacing. That is the end of life. This is all calculated um, for different shapes of materials uh, of anodes. You can do that with elongated standoff anodes, which are the most efficient. And they they're stood 300 millimeters, say, off the surface of structures that you put them on. When you put a, a, a flush one on, um, you're actually reducing the amount of area that you've got because you're not using the back face, but you're also, it's closer to the steel work and you don't get as much current output. Uh, bracelets, again, are, are, are considered as, as a sort of flush material. And these are just basically the this is the, the resistance calculation of the anode is actually detailed in the standards such as DMD. And that's where you, you get your current output for your design of anode material. Um, I'm not going to go into that. This is just showing you the um, anode materials with different, with, with temperature. As temperature goes up, say on hot pipelines, when you're trying to put aluminium anodes on there, the capacity of the anode material uh, is reduced. And that means you have to put a lot more on, two or three times as much in order to get the current output required. So how do we, what do we do? We want to install anodes on say, um, harbor, harbor wall. So you get, a, um, you get this castellated um, steel work with, within pans, and you, we're basically looking at the, the, the area below the water, below the mean sea level, which we can actually protect using anodes. We can't protect the, the still work, which is generally exposed. Um, some of the tidal stuff gives you protection. Um, so, a duplicate there. Um, these, these may be the sort of anodes that you would put on a harbor wall. This is just showing you the real thing. It's uh, ready to go out on a pallet 
to go and be installed in a harbour. And in terms of installation, what are we doing? We're, we're putting them on brackets um, securely to the harbour wall and trying to um, trying to get the, the, these are actually, say, an anode in every in pan on, on something like a harbour wall. And that gives you a, a, a very even distribution of current if, if you're if, if your seabed doesn't doesn't vary, sometimes you get you have to change the the, the weight of the anodes that, that you put along, say a seabed. It's a very good example as to I'll show you that in a second. Um, so this is just showing you the installation of anodes. It's done by cranes, etc., and divers, and uh, similar sort of things where you've got jetties. Um, sometimes shallow water tidal water you can put anodes on to try and get what benefit you can uh, you have to paint the piles and things like that if you really want top protection above the uh, the mean sea level some people do go to the extent of painting it or putting on even petroleum tapes and denso tapes etc to try and um, prevent corrosion then you can survey it um, using a Using a, a, a multimeter and um, and uh, a um, a reference cell, you're able to run along and see whether you've actually got the protection level that you want. So you can walk along, say, the top of a pier, and uh, and contact the uh, the pile and use the reference cell uh, on the say the outpans. And, and do that at the bed level and the, uh, the, the mean sea level, and, and you get a, get a distribution, a variation. Some of these variations are, you know, are real, some of them to do with positioning, and some of them maybe to do with seabed variations, et cetera, and also tailing off of, uh, uh, you know, towards corners and towards drains, whereby, say, there aren't any materials installed. Anode, we've, we've talked about putting anodes in. So this is just showing you the, when, when you actually put an anode in and you put it on a wall or you put it on the system, this is what happens. You, you basically go through this, the, the, the potential is actually rising of the steel work as it, as it actually um, gets drawn towards the, uh, the anode. And this is when you get polarization of the steel and then the protective, des protective design life is whereby you've got a, a constant sort of current going on, it's slightly dropping off. And then you start to get end of life depolarization. This is due to the reduction in the, um, in, in the reduction of the size of the anodes and the, the, the output of the anodes uh, as a result of that. You start to get a, a, a falling system. And the protection levels for uh, steel were are generally from eight minus about minus eight hundred versus um, uh, silver silver chloride uh, uh, electrode, um, and for you know say where you've got um, severe um, accelerated low water corrosion as we do in harbors and things like that, uh, they do specify you you can use a, a level of about nine hundred, and so that that just shows you. This is the time in the uh, depolarization and under protection. That's when you've got to renew your anodes. So you can take them off the brackets. You can put some new ones on. Or in the case of, say, redundant uh, systems, they're just, they're just taking out the C, say, um, manifolds, et cetera. Um, but these days, we're doing a lot of retrofit fit systems. Um, there are lots of different anodes. Um, this is more of a slideshow than anything else. Fishing boats, yeah, you've seen these um, probably, um, in, and, and they're using sink hole anodes in order to put on the, uh, the, the back of fishing boats. These are just a selection of, of anodes here. Um, more importantly, um, manifold anodes, these are the, this is the way that they're arranged. The standoff anodes give you the maximum amount of output for this using this type of anode. 
and that's why they're installed on these frames which are probably going to be utilized for 20 25 maybe 40 years these days um probably with a retrofit of anodes um which uh if we uh we just run down here um you'll see that these are basically retrofits um in other words once your first lot of anodes have run out you've got to put some more on well your pipeline might be under the under the water um, in a trench and it's going to need anodes uh, either uh, you can go and put these on uh, put them around the tubulars adjacent to or swap out and cut off the old anodes um, but they have they have they have additional steel work in order to facilitate this you can also put down anodes onto say manifold frames and things like that whereby you put a load of anodes on a skid and then you pick it up and you put a cable between the um between the skid and you you wire it up to the uh the anode using say clamps and etc onto the the old anode piping and uh wiring and you use use some pretty heavy cable in order to get say to minimize the drop uh between the uh, between the anode skid and the, and and what you're trying to protect, so you can actually put quite a lot of material down there as a retrofit. And you don't have to bring the frame up, as you because you can't, um, and that's what retrofitting is about. Um, this is just a conclusive side, really, just saying um, we can we can use. Um, we do have limitations with sacrificial anodes, and in which case we can use impressed current. And therefore, with impressed current, you can generally just um, just turn up the uh, the control inside the control room and um, adjust the amount of uh, current that you want. But these systems have to be installed with cabling and have to be maintained as well. They're, they're probably a little bit more vulnerable to to damage and 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 failure than than a a sacrificial anode system, which may be you know, people regard as being uh, put it in, you know, and forget about it, which you can uh, essentially. Uh, what do anodes look like when they're used? Well, aluminium isn't pretty, um, and you get this is all the oxide and that which is built up on the anodes, but the anode continues to work through this oxide, uh, which is actually you know centimeters thick all over the surface of the anodes as, it, as it's used up and they, they, the performance really um you know the, these anodes are only are only 50 percent gone um and i suppose i ought to say well you know as i usually do can we have some more anodes please that's that's the end but it's not the end for anodes we we uh we basically supply some more like a bar of soap and you can you can extend the life of your um, system by doing that. Okay, that's that's all I have to say. I'm sorry about the uh, fifteen minute late at the beginning, but uh, questions, please. Thank you very much, Nigel, for that right. presentation. Uh, we got there in the end. So we've yeah. got a, a couple of questions that have come through on our panel. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, uh, please type it in now. Uh, however, I would ask if we can keep it to one question per participant at this moment in time just due to the delay um if anybody wants to follow up with any questions um we we feel free to contact the Ico Aberdeen uh, yeah. gmail address and we can forward them to Nigel and he can address them directly with yourselves um okay we'll start with the first question here which comes from uh I do apologize if I put your name uh Mr. Assam Abdelatif um the question is What's the effect of an increase or decrease in the percentage of impurities in anode efficiency and current? What's the, what's the say that again, please? What? Uh, what's the effect of the increase or decrease in the percentage of impurities in anode efficiency and current? Well, I mean, it's, it, it's not something that's proportional in a sense. Um, the contamination of anode materials with iron and copper um, probably you know it's 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 gradual 
but um, I would say, you know, anode materials which have, say, iron of 0.15% um, usually need some other anode additions, as I mentioned earlier, in order to, to say, try and um, either mop up um, the, the iron by forming intermetallics, etc., cetera, um, or by, um, you know, trying to, you know, sequester the, the material because iron goes into solution, you know, and that's where it's actually um, causing some of the problems and the same with copper. So it's, it's a bit of an on-off thing, particularly with say copper um, of running up to some like point, point double zero five or something. So they don't tolerate these, these contaminants. So there, there are very few other contaminants around um, the others are all intentionally added, things like magnesium, manganese, etc., to alloy, alloys in the in the past. Um, so you no, know, it isn't a proportional thing. It's a very complicated relationship, and it's also it's also one that isn't very well understood. Um, I believe um, certainly trying to you know I don't think people understand the the micro mechanisms of as to what's going on in the interference, they just know that it doesn't work, and you get pole, you get um, passivation of uh, of anode materials. Yeah, about all I can say. Thank you very much for that yeah. uh, answer. Um, okay, uh, the next one we have is from uh, Thierry De Quinn. Um, the question is: Electrochemical capacity. How important is the twelve month testing on every supplier material? Twelve. Did you say 12 point? 12 months testing. For well, the 12 months testing. Well, um, probably a hobby horse of mine, but um, 12 month testing is like type approval. Um, type approval programs are, you know, um, you get a certificate off a, a, a third party lab to actually um, say that your material is, uh, does perform. Uh, at this, at a certain capacity level and, 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 and potential for for a year, uh, they've actually done it. They actually do a test. It's a free running test. So you just you're just joining. I think you're just joining the um, kind of material samples up to up to some steel tubulars and letting them run. Um, you you have got uh, you got some some issues in that. Um, you're not, you're not always, it, certainly uh, the longer term tests, um, they're only for a year and I believe there are some issues. That's why after about say five, five, 20, five to 15 years, anodes actually do drop off. Uh, the performance has dropped off and this is why some materials have actually um, uh, are actually uh, the design capacities of say aluminium is, is rated at about 2000 whereby the sh you know your short term test will give you 2600 uh, and you know, so when you do when you do these uh, long term tests etc they are a little bit closer to reality in terms of the, what happens at site but um I do, yeah, I do question the, you know, the, the use because unless you're actually developing, really developing a new material, in other words, you've, you've discovered a, a new compositional range, which doesn't actually be, doesn't actually correspond to all those which have already been surveyed by say, the whole range of Galvanon 3, which, uh, you know, all the work that was done um, in the 60s, etc., on the development of these material, materials means that your long-term test is basically you, what we have in a situation is uh, we probably have about 10 people around the world all making the same uh, material, say Galvalon 3 or something similar uh, with reduced iron. And we have, we all individually have um, type approval certificates uh, saying that our alloy is better than another one uh, by, you know, 50 ampere hours per, per kilo per year. Um, 
it doesn't make a lot of sense because in fact statistically if you do all this um, you'll probably find that you know the conditions are not the same in the test labs and and the sampling wasn't the same and in fact um in fact i know that um that is that there's a real limitation statistically on what you can actually establish um by taking say 10 50 16 samples or say and running that for a year because you're trying to you're if you're doing the development of an alloy you're actually trying to do highs and lows of different elements within your compositional range so it's really not you know there's not enough work done by one company to actually get a uh, uh, an original alloy which is different to anybody else and unless you do, you know, quite a lot of test, extensive testing, and the type approval thing is is, is actually um, is actually just you know just running a composition that's been run before by other people, but they're actually saying it um, it's just particular to your plant, which is one of the things that the you know the, that that sort of testing establishes. It says you know your plant is producing this and it's unique to you. My question is, is it? Yeah. So I don't I don't think there's a lot in it because it's all been done before and we're all testing very similar materials. And um, there isn't really very much uh, variation and they're all the same, they're all the same type. You, you don't get a lot of animals that fail, um, particularly when they're just in the general uh, mid-range of the compositions that that uh, are already established yeah okay, okay. Thank, thanks for that nigel um we've we've got a couple more to to get through so yeah. let's yeah. let's see if we can um yeah. go through okay so uh next one i have is from uh, tom pepper uh, the question is in retrofit photos the internal surface of the attached bracelets were painted should they be or is it better to be uncoated for continuity continuity once clamped to the existing yeah, good question. I mean, um, usually um, what you probably don't see is there's, uh, there are, I don't know whether anything's still sharing, um, but um, some of these have actually got things like continuity bolts. In fact, the, you know, the, the one that I showed where you've got the, um, you've got these clamps here um they actually have a you actually have a clamp and on on some of these uh retrofit anodes you you then put a volcano bolt through the through the steelwork and you use that as your point of contact so um your you know whilst your steel on the inside of your bands is painted and sometimes sometimes you know people want uh, rubber or whatever put onto these uh onto these bands that are actually being um, put on. And in fact, when you're doing, let's say you're putting a standard bracelet onto a pipe, um, you know, you paint, the, you paint the inside of your anode and then you're actually taking the strap of the, uh, the continuity strap and welding it onto an anode. So, sorry, an anode pad. So most anodes actually are not not reliant on the contact of of the the bands that hold it they're, they're the holding bands what you do have is continuity bolts like volcano bolts you have cables which are also supplied which are, are wired or, or welded onto the steelwork and then welded or brazed pin brazed onto the pipeline so that you get you know that is your connection and it's using you know in that instance you might be using sheath copper um cabling heavy cabling to get the uh, the conduction between your steel work so you, yeah you don't you don't rely upon the inside of the bands which is so which is the mounting and the bolting system to actually get the continuity all right perfect thanks thanks for that okay um, next question is from uh, Alicia Gutzel. Uh, the question is, can you please advise the minimum distance between the anode ID and steel core that we should specify on a bracelet anode drawing to make sure that anode is manufacturable 
and can still keep a utilization factor of around 0 0.8. Yes, yeah, interesting because um, if, if, if you're somebody designs a bracelet and says that um, your bracelet wants to be really thin, uh, like 32 millimeters thick, and then you've got to make steel and put a five mil steel bar within it and put that as close to the to the to the inside surface as possible. Um, I'm sure what you do know is that you have a utilization factor, and that is somewhere around what 0.8 for a, a bracelet maybe, and that means that if you're um, I don't do the maths, but um, if you're if you put your strap um, say five mils, you have a gap between your strap of say five mils before your strap, and then you've got the rest of your material on the outside of that. Um, you have to have, in order to have that five mil gap to, 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 to encompass, to encase the cage that you're trying to cast onto, you need to have you know, some metal uh, on the back of the anode. Um, you, you have to have, you know, and it, you actually are in default sometimes because you um, you can't get, you, you haven't got enough thickness. So you have to resort to, um, yeah, it, 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 it depends. You, you have to resort, resort to say dividing that so that you've got, uh, if it's 0.8, you need 20% of your material. Or you need to strap within, you know, to touch that that last 20% of the material. And uh, quite often it doesn't. I think there's, um, there, was, there are some papers, um, I think Winston Shepherd actually put out um, a paper in 2012, at the, um, which, was, which was actually raising this issue. And it's, um, I suppose, customers and designers and other producers are, are fighting here to try and say, look, um, you can't make really thin um, bracelets and that because we've actually got to put steel, which is, you know, which actually structural steel inside these, these materials, try and hold them together and put them on the pipe. And we've got to encase the whole thing in, in materials. So, so yeah, it is tricky. My, the answer is, um, you know, go with that percentage uh, of, uh, to the position of your strap. So uh, yeah, make your anodes at least say 40, 40 mils thick or preferably 50 mils thick. And then you can say, you know, you've got um, uh, what 50, 20%, you've got 10 mils to, to play with, which is, which is ample. And so if you've got 40, you've got eight mils. And you've got 30, you've got six. So, um, and then it's, just, and then it's debatable as to where the, uh, if it's the back of the strap, the middle of the strap, or the front of the strap. Um, so yeah, but um, all's fair. I think I think what you do find is <laughs> with bracelets is that um, they don't, they're usually um, over designed, and um, and so that's probably compensation there. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that uh, detailed answer. Um, okay, three more. We'll see if we can get through yeah, these quickly. Yeah. So um, the next one I have is from Tarek Nage, Um And I, I think I'll just try and retranslate this. So uh, it, it suggests if there's no place to put anodes horizontally on underground pipes, is it possible to place them on the pipeline bottom at um, half meter spacings instead? Uh, underground pipes? Yeah. I presume. I presume we're not talking about soil here. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm only dealing with seawater um, applications. So, um, could, you, could you say that again? Yeah, I, I presume the question is for um, buried buried pipelines. So, um, yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, we. I don't. I don't think I can answer that because I'm not a. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on. Um, on buried um, land-based systems at all. And in fact, um, the anode materials we're talking about here are not applicable. So yeah, you would need, I believe you need um, magnesium systems, which are in, you know, um, uh, and electrical
electrical systems, electrical impress current systems to, to deal with that. Magnesium, you can, you can bag them and um, you have to put conductive, it has to be a conductive media that the, the material, the, the anodes are sitting in, or you have to have a backfill, which is, which is conductive. But I don't know much about that at all. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that clarification. Um, okay, two more left. Uh, penultimate question from Camilla Godoy. Um, it goes, uh, can you please share pictures of mechanical fitting options for retrofitting cathodic protection of steel piles? Um, share pictures. And I guess if you if you don't have pictures uh, available at this moment in time, we um, you may be able to forward them to yourself, Camilla, if that's required. Yeah. Of of steel piles. I mean, the. Um, I mean, we basically. You know, I mean. No, I, I can't share any pictures at the moment, of course. Um, but um, it, it's a it retrofitting. So you can retrofit, say, harbor piles, tubulars, by you know doing something like doing something like this. Um, that we've shown here. You can put those on harbour tubulars and uh, as well as, as on platforms and, and uh, underwater pipes, etc. They, they will fit. So, you know, um, this, is, this is the sort of system that you can use. And, and a lot of the time, people are not going to, the, going to all this bother to put lots of steelwork on because they've got divers installing it. However, there are situations where you, if you're trying to fit something on a very fast flowing river, say, um, or, you know, harbour, and you, and it's dangerous, you, you may want to spend as little time as possible in the water. So you use this sort of retrofit bracelet sort of situation whereby you, you can put something in, lower it in, clamp it and be out. Um, and that's that's where that's some advantage there in reducing the, the diving time where you you haven't got lots of underwater welding etc. Yeah, that's about all I can say. Okay, thank you for that. And um, the last question you have um, is from Brian Wyatt, so it's it's a long one. So um, oh no, so <laughs> yeah, I'll save the best for last. So. Um, uh, we'll just uh, bear with me as I read this out. So it goes, uh, Nigel, would you yeah. comment on whether any composition within the BSEN 12496, each of A1, A2, and A3 can be expected to perform equally? More clearly, taking, say, alloy A2, can any new foundry expect to produce optimum anodes using the full range of compositions permitted within uh, the standard uh, EN 12496? without the expertise of the originally alloy developers like Dow, British Aluminium, and Sumitomo. Many think they can. The licensed producers had secret, tighter, optimized compositions. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I'd have to say, can you read that again? But um... Um, it'll be in your Q&A box if you put it up um, on screen um, yeah. to clarify. I mean, I think um, alloy A2, where's my Q&A box? Do I have a full box? Uh, uh, sorry, I let uh, Brian to, to talk if he wants yeah. to ask the question or discuss. Yeah. And uh, I can see his question now. Yeah. Whether any any composition with them can be expected to perform equally. Any composition okay. more for them yeah. saying alloy two. Can any new foundry expect to produce optimum energy using a full range of compositions? If I may, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Nigel, uh, the thank yeah. you for the thank yeah. you presentation. Um, yeah. The issue is that, that, that those compositions in that standard, which yeah. are widely quoted in other standards and by manufacturers, yeah. are, are, are actually broad spectrum indications of types of anodes, as opposed to compositions that have been proven to give good performance. Yeah. 
I mean, um, um, yeah. And, 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 and my, my, my question to you is, is and it, it's really more to people who might be buying anodes from the, the newer producers around the world. Um, you know, they are producing to that broad spectrum. Would mm. you expect anodes to perform well over the whole spectrum that's permitted, for example, in A2? Well, A2 is, um, A2 is NORSOC 503. Yes, I know. Yeah, um, I mean, that has a, uh, that has maximum, uh, just maximum levels of iron and silicon, I think. Yes. So there's no, no silicon addition. Um, it's, um, I don't know, I mean, people are using that uh, very broadly uh, throughout the oil industry. As a as a as a standard, really, um, and they, you know, I mean, yes, when you take that, it, it's when you take something to another environment, let's say, you know, Caspian Sea, um, where whereby you know, they're now, I believe, some people are now struggling with 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 these anode compositions and saying, um, yeah. What have we got to do uh, to to get things work? We've got a you know either highly uh, you know a, a low saline or very high saline environments, uh, and um, how can we can we just use the standard materials? Um, I was asked uh, ten years ago about providing this and then providing evidence, and no um, for special applications at certain depths and you know. Um, in reduced uh, in higher resistivity waters and that and they say well you know can you can you do some I, i've done some tests but um i can't do comprehensive tests and um yeah, i i know that there, there are some people struggling at the moment with uh, somewhere at the caspian sea and they're going back to using zinc um i think so um it's um it depends on, you know, you've got H2S, you've got other other environments which they're encountering, um, which, um, so it's the environment change. It's probably very fine, you know, for a new foundry, as you, if you mention that to, you know, to pop up in Southeast Asia and then start making anodes, which are just going to be used in, um, you know, the local geographical area. And they're probably going to perform fine, but it's just, it's all the parameters when they start to change together. Um, I suppose when you you know you mix these, you know, like you get this H2S and you you know, your high salts and, and things like that all together, and people are asking you like they like they do in processing vessels etc. You've got CO2s of various, so that, and then you're going to put aluminium anodes in it, and then you're going to operate it at 100 degrees centigrade. Um, and you just go, whoa, 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 you know. So um, it's just the special environments that, that you have to deal with. It, it's not the case of, you know, I would say, you know, alloy A2 is probably going to work in um, in most situations um, in water, you know, 30, 30 meters deep, et cetera, and harbors and all sorts of places like this. But um, you know, you're not going to be able to pick them up without extensive trials. And I don't know, I wasn't around when a lot of that work was done. I've read some of the papers, but it looks like they, yeah, as you say, there was a lot of work done and um, not all of, all of it was revealed. Uh, but yeah, uh, precisely. And, 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 and sadly, only people who should be fully retired, like me, Wynn and Bob Crumble, um, yeah. probably, probably know about those things. But, but what, what, what bothers me particularly is the application of bracelets on pipelines, um, where um, the, the, the people who buy the bracelets um, just know about this standard and, 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 and they permit um, the most wide um, compositional changes um, within that standard. And that is a trap. That really is a trap. But, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a, you know, going back on someone else's earlier question, you know, 
even with the you know type approval and and that you you can't you can't because the way the uh, you know accelerated testing etc happens and and the conditions it's very difficult for anybody these days unless you a massive lab set up to to be able to say look we're designing anodes for for this catchment c and we're going to do all these tests before it's going to be a, it's up to operators and people like that who are going to have to to, to do that work if they if they're going to you know they're going to greater depths they're going to new places they're getting they're trying to trying to get oil out of places where it's um, it, it, it's not expected um, i totally agree so um yes there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done but it's but it's a very small fraction of of what is done in the world and uh, yeah i i know what you mean it's um it's very very difficult to because everybody just looks at these and then in fact i get a lot of designers who just come and say oh yeah i say what's the spec and they go ah oh, you know tell me you know <laughs> um they not everybody knows about it um designers are not the designers are not cp engineers either a lot of the time half of them are you know no no disrespect but a lot of them are mechanical engineers structural engineers and they they, they do they design cp systems they say it's all right i can get dnv out and i can do that tell, tell me about it and you Thank can you. Um, um, most most of my living nowadays is, is is made in legal cases dealing with those people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> very good. It's a, uh, it's it's quite it's quite difficult to control other engineers. Probably doing, you know, I'm not even a CP engineer, but other engineers doing, you know, um, high level work in that area. And, well, um, I mean, no, no I, I, I think the standards are clear. The standards all say that a, a CP design must must be done by a a a, a, a CP specialist to level four um, in 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 ISO one one two whatever the number is. Um, yeah. And 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 the issue is that it isn't policed by the operators. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean. Um, I, I, I've been I, on the phone this week talking to people who are designing stuff and go, you know, well, I can't, I can't really say anything more. But um, yes, and I, I said, well, I, I can't design it for you, but, but I don't think I'm not sure that you you actually um, know all the stuff, um, you know, because you expect that people, that big operators and that, they're going to have the specialists doing it, but then you find out. The job has been given to somebody else. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt people's qualifications, and they're very capable. But um, there's a, it's a problem. It's a problem with CP. Uh, you know, it's one of those industries where everybody doesn't understand it. They don't quite know what it is. Who understands electrochemical testing? <laughs> it's like uh, not very many yeah. people in the world. Um, well, yeah. gents, just just to just to draw yeah. this one to, yeah. to okay. uh, close. So, thank, thanks very much for that question, Brian. Uh, I knew those yeah. reasons. I was saving yeah. it for the end. So, yeah. um, I have yeah. a, uh, one more has snuck in uh, while that conversation has been going on from uh, Patrick Bruce. Uh, uh, quick question: um, uh, Are, are you, you yeah? Are you mm -hmm. aware of a solution that protects both carbon steel and doesn't overprotect duplex, i.e., in the range of minus eleven hundred millivolts to versus minus five hundred millivolts? um protects well <clears throat> i only say that when you look at that um you'd have to say i think i think some people have actually decided um yeah you you can't have a sacrificial anode only gives one output um so the only i believe that some people use the use the idea of Putting the anode far away <laughs> as being uh, the only way to protect some duplex um, using a an aluminium anode. And at least I know people did that um, ten years ago when they didn't have a solution. But you know, you have to. You probably, and I, I think Brian might be able to answer this, or 
uh, Robin Jacobs, uh, is are you actually going to have these systems which are mixed? You have to isolate. You have to isolate those uh, those systems one from the other, and um, you you can only put sacrificial animals only work at one level. So if you you can use uh, say these um, alloy A4 there, which is now developed to using gallium uh, to give you a, um, a protected level suitable for duplex. It's what minus 500 to, to minus 800 at a maximum, um, and you can only put those, you can put those sacrificial anodes on or you can use electrical systems to impress a current, but you have to, you would have to separate the two systems and isolate them because this idea of saying, okay, I've got duplex pipe and I've joined it to a carbon steel pipe. And what I'll do is I'll not put any stuff on the duplex, but I'll just put the anodes a long way along, with, along the, uh, the carbon steel pipe. And then by the time the current gets there, it will have, and have lost enough so it's not even protected. And that's probably one of the only ways that I know that you can not do it by isolate. Yeah. Uh, don't know whether I've answered the question, but it's a it's an awkward one. Um, it certainly is. But uh, thanks, thanks for the interesting answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, that's all the questions I have. I think Camilla just had a query, but um, I believe that uh, the PDF slide will be available on the ICO Aberdeen website. Is that correct, Herman? Yes, that, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oli, uh, for the questions. And thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Nigel Owen, for, for the presentation. And thanks all for uh, staying with us uh, very late. It's almost eight o'clock here. And uh, apologies again for, for the uh, technical uh, issues that happened. Uh, so just just a quick one. Uh, when you're leaving the uh, the the webinar, there will be a survey, a short survey. Uh, please fill it if you want the CPD certificate, especially. Uh, and uh, and then that's all. Uh, the recording will be available on the YouTube channel. The PDF uh, of the slide will be available on the website. You can download it later, maybe like in a couple of days. Uh, and uh, uh, just a quick reminder, the next presentation will be on 25th of January. We will not have a, any uh, webinar in the, the December. And the next presentation will be by University of Leeds, again by a Zoom webinar. So you will receive a flyer and the link to register for that. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, everyone, for staying uh, with us uh, and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Yeah, also take care, uh, festive greetings. Oh, and yeah. We'll catch take you care. all in the new year in 2022. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Happy Christmas. Take care. Everyone. Stay safe. <laughs> Happy Amazon. <laughs> 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 Okay. Thanks, Professor Babs, for staying with us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Very good. Very good. Mm.